Hi, my name is Rob Corliss, and I'm going to be talking today about algebraic companions. This talk is intended for uh, the International Linear Algebra Society uh, meeting in Galway in Ireland. The slides are available at my website, uh, rcorliss.github.io. The slides include links to various papers, so you might actually want them. This talk is based on the following four papers. Uh, the first one uh, by my then PhD student, Eunice Chan, and myself uh, called A New Kind of Companion Matrix. So this is the, uh, where the bit basic idea of today's talk was first articulated. The second paper describes uh, a, our solution of a problem posed to us by Donald Knuth. And by being able to solve that problem, we realized it was in fact a perfectly general uh, technique. And so that, that was kind of an important paper on there. Later, we extended this to from companion matrices to linearizations of matrix polynomials. And that, uh, together with various co-authors, that paper uh, appeared in linear algebra and applications. Uh, most recently, we have tidied up some of the details and uh, made a, an extension to what we call generalized standard triples, which allow us to build things in a nice way. So that's a 2021 electronic linear algebra uh, paper. There are many people who have contributed to this. Neil Kalkin, uh, Lalo Gonzalez Vega, Don Knuth, Piers Lawrence, uh, Juana Sendra, her brother Rafa Sendra, and Stephen Thornton. All of those I'm very grateful for the help. I also thank Freuland Dopico for an exceptionally detailed and patient uh, editor's job for the last paper on generalized standard triples. So thank you for that. Uh, this talk is also related to Mandelbrot polynomials and matrices. So my first work on this was with Peers, uh, and indeed Peers had the fundamental idea, which opened the door to all these results. Uh, but our uh, work on the, the whole thing, uh, Mandelbrot polynomials, arose from Dario Bini and co-workers' use of Mandelbrot polynomials as a test problem for their MPSolve uh, software. And that, uh, by the way, MPSolve is still the best polynomial uh, root finder that we know of. So the 2014 version is, yeah, it's pretty good. So Neil Kalkin and Eunice Chan and I have written a little bit more about Mandelbrot polynomials. We have a, a paper in Maple Transactions. I'm the editor in chief of Maple Transactions. Maple Transactions is a, a free open access journal, free in the sense that there are no page charges. This is uh, uh, possible by the sponsorship of uh, Waterloo Maple or MapleSoft and uh, also the sponsorship of my uh, university, Western University. Uh, the topics of the journal are those of interest to the Maple community, and so I uh, recommend that you have a look and see if you can uh, uh, contribute something to Maple Transactions. So we also have a paper which was accepted last year but has finally appeared this year in the American Mathematical Monthly on uh, Mandelbrot matrices. The paper title is called Fractal Eigenvector, and I think some of you might enjoy reading that. So this is just our work. Of course, this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. There are many strongly uh, related papers by other people, but I particularly want to point out a paper by uh, uh, Robel, Vandermill, and Van Duren in 2017. And there's a link uh, here to that paper in, in the slides on my web page. Another related thread of work is what I call Bohemian matrices. So some of you have, will have heard me talk about bohemian matrices and I'm going to be giving a talk next week uh, at uh, ISAC on bohemian matrix geometry and I will be giving a talk at Nick Hyam's uh, 60th birthday conference on bohemian matrix geometry. Uh, you might find material in the in Wikipedia. On this, we have a Wikipedia link on bohemian matrices now. You might have seen it in the cover of the London Math Society newsletter in 2020. 
We have a paper in LAA on Upper Hestenberg and Toplitz Bohemians. I've got a couple of papers in Maple Transactions on, on these things. And most recently, and the thing that I'm uh, most happy to announce about right now is that our uh, online or open educational resource, that's with Neil Kalkin and Eunice Chan, uh, it's called Computational Discovery on Jupiter. So that's available online now, that version. Chapter four of that, you can find an introduction to Bohemian matrices. I'm very pleased to announce that uh, we've been offered a contract from, by Siam and we're going to sign that contract. And so this will be a Siam book. I'm very pleased. So the print version and the online version are going to work together, we hope, and we have big plans for that stuff. So watch this space. Hopefully the book will be out by next year. But I'm not going to talk about Bohemian matrices, no matter how that they're lots of fun and we've got calendars and pictures and images, and lots of stuff. Forget it. We're, this is a talk about companions, companion matrices in general, or linearizations of matrix polynomials or local linearizations of matrix polynomials. What's up? Uh, suppose we have a local linearization for a dimension n matrix polynomial A of X and a, a linearization a local linearization for dimension n polynomial b of x with uh, the usual arrangement of factors. We have this invertible factor ea times zba minus aa times the invertible factor fa. If those factors are unimodular, then we have a not just a local linearization, but a linearization such that the, the pencil is transformed to be diagonal a of z and the identity matrix. So similarly, if uh, uh, we have the same thing for the uh, matrix polynomial B of X, great, we've got these linearizations. Now what we want to do with that is we wish to construct a local linearization, a new one for C of X, which is X times A of X times B of X plus D. So D is some constant uh, matrix of dimension N. Suppose that we do not wish to expand this out because we are afraid of making the conditioning worse. As a numerical analyst, that's a natural thing to want. Well, what do we do then? We've got one for A and B. We want to reuse that somehow to make a new one for C. Can we do that? Yes. Theorem 1.7, which is the final one where all the details were laid out. It's in the generalized standard triple paper. Uh, if we have these rational matrices such that it's invertible uh, in Z is sigma A, and uh, uh, similarly, we've got the one for, for B with the, they're, it's invertible if uh, Z is in sigma B, then I can construct, we can construct uh, a new local linearization of C of Z for all set in the intersection of those two sets where those have got to be valid for both of those linearizations. And what are this, what does this linearization look like? Well, here we are on the next slide. So B is just formed from the B matrices of uh, each piece. And the A matrix is formed from the A matrices of each piece. I see another typo here. I fixed one typo the previous practice round. That should be an A. Uh, down here, that should be an A. So we have <coughs> the A matrices from each of those uh, pieces. It should be A sub B, not B sub A, uh, in the proper corners. And then we have material that glues these things together that arise from the standard triples, the generalized standard triples uh, of the individual pieces. So I, if I know all of the, the data for the A matrix, then I can form the XA and the YA. And I can form, if I know all the data from the B matrix, I can form the XB and the YB. And that means that I can form this matrix here. Great. How do we prove this? The proof is multiply it all out do various permutations and do various simplifications and it works. Uh, so we just form the 
what you would expect to do, multiply things out in the, in the right way that you have to do. And it's not quite in the right order, but you do various permutations and various simplifications. And the key simplification is the following one, uh, which is very straightforward, a straightforward multiplication. Uh, and away we go. Not expecting you to follow all of the details on the proof of those. That was just a sketch. Uh, the experts among you will say, oh yeah, that's covered the, the main details. Uh, but if you want to see how it all works, you actually have to go and see the GSD paper and all the details are laid out there. Now, I'd like to say that that's our proof, but no, we had a much more complicated proof based on sure complements, uh, sure factorings. It was referee who said, no, no, why don't you just do it this way? We went, Yes, of course, that's much better. So thank you very much to the referee for this improved proof. Why? Why are we interested in uh, algebraic companions, algebraic linearizations? The reason is that this is completely different. It's a new class of linearizations. It's different from all of the other ones that have been invented to date. And it gives a whole new set of tools for dealing with it. And for instance, let's consider Newton's example of polynomial. Every new root finder, you, you have to solve uh, Newton's example of polynomial. It's the equivalent of coming in at the little gate. So uh, I'm going to make a variation out of it. Instead of x cubed minus 2x minus 5, I'll say x cubed minus tx minus 5, and I'll let t be a parameter. Now, uh, I can immediately rewrite that as x times x squared minus t minus 5. So that's x times x minus root t times x plus root t minus 5. And now we use the uh, straightforward companion matrix root t for the polynomial x minus root t and the straightforward companion matrix minus root t for the polynomial x plus root t and glue them together with this recipe. And we do that, and we have a new matrix with entries root t, 0, 5, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, and minus root t. So that those things occur in no other linearization that I know of. If you start with a polynomial p of x expressed in the monomial basis, and you change it to Chebyshev basis, or Legendre uh, basis, or Lagrange basis, or Hermite interpolational basis, or lots of things, you won't get square root of t. You'll always get t's. Okay, if we take this matrix and we compute the eigenvalues when, for instance, t equals 200,000, then we get the, uh, all of the eigenvalues to relative error of 10 to the minus 13 or better, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 13 or better. The smallest one is the hardest one to correct, uh, compute correctly. But if I just go ahead and use the Frobenius companion of the original thing, so minus 5, uh, pardon me, 5t0 and the, the ones in the normal place, then the Frobenius companion matrix has an error about 10 to the minus, relative error about 10 to the minus 9 in the smallest eigenvalue. So much worse. All right, let's try different values of t for that same example. And we compute the relative error in the smallest eigenvalue algebraic linearization in blue versus Frobenius linearization in red. So as the parameter varies, from about 10 to the 4th to 10 to the 16, uh, we see that the relative error grows for the uh, uh, algebraic linearization. The blue one grows like square root of t, 10 to the minus 16 times square root of t. And the error in the Frobenius form grows like 10 to the minus 17 times t to the 3 halves. So it's a factor of t worse. And so this means by about t equals 10 to the 12, we get a 100% error. Just absolutely hopeless in there. Uh, this, this is a pretty clear and convincing victory for this small example. Great. Try a bigger example. We created a dimension 3, so 3 by 3 matrices, grade 5 example, by choosing two uh, random matrix polynomials of grade 2 dimension 3 and a dimension three matrix D, these just chosen at random, and I form C equals Z times A times B plus D. Okay, we perturbed it in two different ways. 
you kick the A and B separately, or you kick the C, and we compare the algebraic linearization made of the Frobenius linearization for, of A and the Frobenius linearization of B to the ordinary Frobenius linearization for the explicitly expanded C. So it's essentially a random example. And here we see the pseudospectra of the two different kinds of linearizations. So the, the one on the left is the algebraic linearization, and you see that there are tighter curves. So that means that you kick the uh, polynomial or kick the matrix polynomial to coefficients. The eigenvalues don't change very much, whereas on the Frobenius one, you kick it and they change uh, uh, more significantly. Again, this is a random example which says that sometimes things can be better with algebraic linearizations. So, okay, there's, there's things to explore here. We do not have anything like all of the answers for this. We think that the potentially improved numerical stability arises because the height of the new matrices can be lower. Now, it's not always true that when you factor something, you get lower height, but you frequently do. So sometimes you, when you factor, you get larger height. And we don't recommend doing algebraic linearization in that case. Uh, what's the height of a matrix? The height of a matrix is the infinity norm of the vectorization of A. So it's the absolute value of the largest element in, in the matrix. So it's a matrix norm, but not a submultiplicative norm, which kind of messes up a lot of our techniques. So the height of AB is not necessarily less than the height of A times the height of B. And of course, we can force it to be one by scaling. So we might profitably think about what is the smallest non-zero element. And the distance between zero and the smallest non-zero element might be the, the, the real numerical reason why things are going crazy. But it, you know, part of a, uh, an interesting collection of numerical techniques to scale things properly, maybe scaling things properly it means factoring in some way. Well, that raises another question. If we're given the recursive construction for our matrix polynomial in the first place, such as, for instance, the Mandelbrot polynomials, you start with uh, uh, a single matrix and uh, you build up uh, the next one by doubling these two together, and then you take the copies of that, and then you take the copies of that, and you take the copies of that, and that fits the Mandelbrot recurrence relation. That's, that's an obvious thing that you want to be able to do. Um, so doing that way, that's great. But if somebody hands you a matrix polynomial, it's dimension 300 by 300 and it's degree 16, you say, well, can I find factors in a reasonable way? And is it a sensible thing to, to even try to do? Uh, perhaps you have a whole class of such problems and you want to find a reasonable way of factoring these things for that class. We looked at, for instance, camera pose problems and get some effect. Okay, but how far can you take it? Can you factor the factors? Can you can you reduce things down in you know, kind of an FFT kind of recursive way to, to get things to be as stable as possible? So an alternative question is if your matrix entries are all integers, then it's natural to say, okay, what is the lowest height integer linearization? And how do we compute that? It looks like some kind of discrete optimization problem. Uh, I've asked a few friends for advice on that, but they just kind of look at me and say, well, I don't know how to do that. We'll see. We'll see what we can do. Now, why we want to do this is because the Mandelbrot matrix example shows that the minimal height for the Mandelbrot polynomials, which is one for any dimension, uh, can be exponentially smaller than the size of the coefficients of the original polynomial. Mandelbrot polynomials coefficients grow exponentially in the degree. That's doubly exponentially in the in the end for the recurrence relation. So it's, it's they grow really really quickly, and so the conditioning of matrix polynomials can be very very large in comparison with the conditioning of the minimal height linearization. And with that, with the questions, I'm happy to take further questions or suggestions as to how to uh, approach these other problems. And I thank my sponsors, 
uh, NSERC and the Spanish MICINN.